Hello and welcome to the Connection podcast. Uh, I am joined today by two industry professionals. I've got uh, Neil Osmond from NOA Associates. I've got uh, Tony Moskrup, and uh, we are going to be talking about alternatives uh, and alternative use of papers. Um, Neil, I'd like to come to you first, uh, please. Um, Obviously, uh, sustainability is is hot back on the agenda again. Um, you know, we're looking at um, lighter weight solutions for uh, for paper and for packaging. Um, so obviously, those are significant drivers that are impacting on the industry. Um, so green agenda is back. Um, give us your views on, on on what's happening and why green is back on the agenda so firmly. Well, I, I think there's a, a couple of things. I think COVID. Uh, uh, as an experience for people, they've been at home, uh, they've been um, in their gardens, they've been noticing wildlife and, and the environment, and uh, I'm listening to a bit of tweeting outside of my uh, home office at the moment. Um, so uh, people have become much more aware of that. I think they've um, indulged in, in, um, uh, uh, in encouraging more green aspects. And then you know, there, there's been a, um, a recognition that packaging coming through the door that there's there's a huge amount a huge amount of internet um, uh, sales that have caused people to um, uh, to, to uh, become a bit more uh, uh, buying products that are, uh, are in that area so I think the green agenda has become a bit more apparent um, uh, the, the, the use of paper packaging a bit more apparent I think also um, that there's other aspects but perhaps we'll, we'll come to those in a second uh, and um, Neil obviously um you know, one of the other big uh, issues that we're, we're sort of addressing at the moment, single use packaging yes. uh, plastics. Yes. Uh, obviously, there's uh, legislation uh, coming into effect next year. Yes. Um, so, you know, what impact is that having on the industry? Yeah, and that's the other thing that I was alluding to. Um, legislation, it does have teeth. Legislation does make a difference. And there is no doubt that um, OEMs, so original equipment manufacturers are having to change away from particularly EPS, expanded polystyrene, from the uh, wrapping around their products and actually you know, being part of the content of some of their uh, products. So um, the, the legislation that's uh, prevail, uh, prevailing in mainland Europe is prevailing for everywhere in Europe, and we're, we're part of that in the UK. Um, but uh, that, that legislation is forcing people to get out of um, plastics materials and are finding um, uh, packaging solutions. And the packaging solution could be in corrugated, it could be in folding cartons, or it could be in honeycomb. And, and um, Neil, if, if we um, just look at some of these uh, alternatives that you're talking about, I mean, um, reported heavily in the press, uh, just recently I saw Tony Hitchin um, from Procart and uh, a great photo of him at Wimbledon uh, with strawberries in a, a folding carton board punnet. So uh, obviously there's a lot of the, um, the food producers who are now starting to make that switch away from uh, the, the traditional plastic containers for, for fruits uh, and now looking at carton board. Absolutely. I mean, we've been reporting, and as you know, as well as um, the, the, the report for um, Emfer and, and for Tony, um, we do the report for ECMAR. And for the last few years, and ECMAR is European Carton Manufacturers Association. So we've been reporting on what's happening with all the, um, uh, a, a lot of projects that uh, brand owners have been giving folding carton companies over the last three, four, five years. They're coming to fruition. Excuse the pun about the, the fruit and the strawberries, but they are coming to fruition. And we've seen in, in the, a couple of years ago, it was tomatoes that were coming in lovely little punnets made out of carton board material. Um, so fruit is a particularly good one, a premium fruit. I mean, you'll see um, pink lady um, apples being wrapped in, um, in carton. So that's the very obvious sign of um, the, the, the change. But there are literally tens of thousands of, of NDAs that I know of that are out uh, in the market that brand owners have to change away from a plastic product they've got into a, a, a fiber, paper fiber solution. And that, that wave seems to be coming in now and people are, have made those obvious changes. Um, Tony, um, I'd like to come to you now, please, um, because 
Neil uh, used a word uh, earlier, uh, honeycomb. Um, obviously uh, made of paper, um, but for our traditional corrugated and folding carton audience, um, they may be aware of it, but just tell us a little bit about exactly what is honeycomb uh, and looking at some of the industry sectors that might be able to utilize it. Yeah, paper honeycomb really falls into sort of three product categories. You've got the use of uh, recycled paper honeycomb as a core material. Uh, you've got uh, the use of paper honeycomb as a board uh, material. And then you've got the conversion of the board to specific applications for various industries. So just taking the honeycomb as a core material then, um, that's um, alternative glue lines put between uh, bits of paper, um, which are then cut off to a thickness um, to, to create the paper honeycomb structure, which you perhaps see behind me there. There's, yeah, that's what paper honeycomb is, uh, if you want a visual. Um, cell sizes vary uh, quite quite widely, you know, typically from eight millimeters to about 45 millimeters. Um, thicknesses typically 10 to 30, but can go from five right up to 150 as well. So there's uh, some really good um, applications that can, can use those thicknesses. Uh, but those industry players really concentrate in the uh, sort of doors, panels and the automotive and furniture sector. And then, um, Tony, um, tell us a little bit about the, the, the actual, uh, the raw material then that, uh, that you're using to, to manufacture the honeycomb. Um, in layman's term, is it similar to, um, you know, what we would be using as a fluting or a liner in the corrugating process? Same product. I think uh, they might have a different code at the paper mill, perhaps to put a, a small premium on it, but, <laughs> but yeah, basically the same product. Um, and um, obviously, um, uh, we, we were, you know, in the introduction to, to the podcast, Neil uh, mentioned the word EMPHA, uh, E-M-P-H-A. Uh, tell us, what is EMPHA? EMPHA is um, an association of manufacturers that are operating in this space. Um, it was formed in 2010 when some of the industry leaders got together uh, to discuss probably some of the market forces that were, were being applied, you know, standardization of cells and, and uh, products like that. So like-minded people from the industry decided to join and, and form the, the association. So it's 11, 12 years old now. Uh, we concentrate on those technical standards uh, and also on growing the, the industry, growing the pie as we call it. <laughs> uh, we've got 12 members. Uh, with 16 plants across Europe. So we're a small association at this stage. Um, but uh, with the work that we've done with Neil, you know, there's, um, there's lots of changes and growth to be had in EMFA. So the association is going to change significantly in the coming five years. And um, likewise for its members. And, and Tony, um, as, as a paper-based product, uh, and obviously representing your, your members. Um, is there some uh, aspiration for alignment with um, some of the leading sort of European associations for other paper-based packaging products like Fefco or Etmar or Procast? And I mean, is it, because obviously lobbying is a very important part of any uh, trade association. <clears throat> yeah, well, uh, so some of us individual members are, are part of the um, associations in their countries. Uh, for example, we are members of the CPI in the UK, so we've got a little bit of a, oh, there's a, some honeycomb guys there. <laughs> um, Emperor is actually a member of SITPA, so in the sort of conversion side, we've, you know, we've got a voice and we, uh, we hear what's coming down the legislation uh, channels there and we can respond and support uh, them as well. Um, but the beauty of it is that um, being part of that overall paper industry, all the arguments are established. You know, we, we, we just need to convert that to how does it affect the honeycomb uh, sector? Um, Neil, um, when we uh, are looking at honeycomb, effectively, this is, uh, you know, a byproduct of, well, it's a paper product. Yeah. Uh, and yet again, showcases um, you know, the, we can actually be quite an ingenious lot in the, the paper-based yeah. packaging industry, right? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, uh, part of the um, attraction of 
this project was the innovation that um, was evident within the EMPFA members. And it just reminded me of all that's been going on in the corrugated industry and the folding carton industry for, for many um, decades. We've got some brilliant designers in, in all three of these industries. Um, and and we're, you know, we're even building innovation centers uh, around Europe and around the world to attract brand owners and, and uh, OEMs to come and, and give their, their sort of naughty projects to, to us. And, and you know, there's never a better time to be coming to every member, whether it's a member of, um, of, of EMFA, whether it's a member of ECMA or, or a member of FEFCO, all, all those industries have got great design skills and can take those plastic um, products and, and have already got some fantastic solutions in place. So yeah, we, we're really, I mean, it's a fantastic story. And I was really intrigued by how brilliant the guys in, in EMFA are and how clever, and, and Tony will talk a bit about some of the new markets that EMFA have got into because of clever, thoughtful designs and entrepreneurs and innovators. Um, so Tony, um, obviously um, you guys are looking at it and saying, uh, you know, there's going to be opportunities for growth. Um, there are exciting market opportunities for you. Um, give us a little bit of overview as to as to you know where you see that growth coming from over the next sort of five ten years. Well, the main uh, growth driver really is we've already talked about it. It's the sustainability drive that's going on on now. Uh, you know, in this little honeycomb sector, we've uh, been trundling along in our little niche. Uh, this is making people lift the lid now because sustainability is on everyone's agenda and it's, it's driving all sorts of initiatives. We've been in there like the corrugated guys for donkey's years. Uh, we've got recycled products that are fully recyclable. So they're the sort of things that are attracting people now to really start looking at, at uh, these things. And light weighting is the other side of it. Light weighting goes hand in hand with material reduction and again fits into that uh, sustainability space as well. So, uh, you know, that those are the sort of general drivers. And I think, you know, over the last five years, we've seen uh, some of the larger paper manufacturers start moving into the sector. Uh, so again, that's going to help drive, drive growth as well. The next five years, I think, with uh, all the big brands and big industrial companies and the retailers have all got net zero all on the, in the sites now. So that's going to really drive those people to really look at everything. And uh, with people looking at everything, there's threats and we like to look at the opportunities and, and really drive for the opportunities. And uh, it's a very exciting time for the, uh, the paper honeycomb sector. And Neil, um, part of the work that, that you've done with, with EMFA was obviously putting together some um, facts and figures, some stats and some projections for the market. So um, obviously within the broader paper-based packaging industry, uh, we're, we're on a boon at the moment with you know, e-commerce, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. But um, um, give us a little bit of uh, some sort of facts and figures as to uh, how you see it all panning out over the next five years. Sure. I mean, the phenomenal thing is this industry, the, the honeycomb industry, has grown by an average of 15% year on year for the last five years. Um, and uh, from discussion with, with members and, and with non-members, because actually, as Tony says, there's, there's a, a core of members, there's actually a large number of non-members, and, and for sure that some of them will be joining them. Those um, collectively, they was, were indicating huge optimism about the growth for the future and it looks like plus 20 percent at least year on year growth for the next five years and and that's easily um seen because of the the different market sectors um that honeycomb is now being used for and so uh, tony uh, in terms of um uh, you know the paper mills um because obviously uh, you know, when they're running these big uh, container borne uh, machines, you know, nine metres plus in, in width, and invariably there's going to be some sort of side runnage and side tonnage. I mean, is, is this um, uh, the honeycomb sector, should it be really appealing for, uh, for the big uh, container borne producers? It has been, and I think it'll continue to be. Um, you know, the, those off runs are quite good for our <laughs> our sector so you know that makes it good for the the paper, paper companies as well 
Um, I think to put it in perspective now, from a paper mill point of view, we're just in our in the next five years, we'll probably get to um, our industry will get to the capacity of probably a, a, a mid-sized paper company, five hundred thousand tons or something like that. So it's still the whole industry is still only one mill. Um, but once we get through to that breakthrough phase, then well, who knows where where it's going to go. Um, because there's lots of high added value in um, converting this paper down the, the honeycomb channel. And, and Tony, um, obviously you, you said um, the, the association, you have 12 uh, active members at the moment. Um, uh, what sort of dialogue are you having with, with some of the, like the, the big boys, you know, the, the sort of the Smurfit Kappas, the Mondies? I mean, is there any sort of interest from their side? Because ultimately, if it's a paper product uh, and it's paper that can be converted into a packaging solution, um, would it be, you know, feasible that these big guys are going to get get involved within the mix? Mondi and um, Syker have shown interest in the association. Syker are, are members. Uh, Mondi are very interested in this report. Um, Smurfit Kappa have got honeycomb uh, facilities in in, in their organisation. Uh, they have been members um, prior to uh, the takeover from Smurfit. Um, DS Smith have got a small operation as well. So, you know, there's people looking at uh, perhaps better added value routes for their paper. Fantastic. Uh, Neil, you wanted to add something in there. Yes. I mean, the interesting thing about this market, and I suppose um, there's, there's, uh, Tony says there's, there's already some well known names. Either they've got honeycomb facilities or they've got um, paper making facilities and they're supplying the market. But there, there's, there's um, been a, a number of companies that have been acquired um, of late. So there's, um, so not, not necessarily by companies in the paper market. In fact, interestingly, companies who've been in um, the plastics industry have been acquiring companies, evidently seeing maybe a, a swapping of what they focused on. There's an sort of EPS company who, uh, in the past, putting their money now into this market because they obviously see the growth opportunities. Um, so I think there's our traditional paper companies plus other other companies are, are, are investing, which is which is encouraging. And it, um, and you're saying about some of the statistics, um, the, the unusually the, the, some of the market sectors, and I'm not sure if we'll cover this later, but some of the specific market sectors that are growing and, and how they're growing is is in this in the hunt for the use of honeycomb is amazing, absolutely amazing. So it's very attractive. Um, so, so Tony, um, Neil alluded to it there. I mean, looking at the individual markets now and those prospects for growth, um, you mentioned, you know, uh, sort of the traditional markets, you know, furniture, um, automotive, etc. Um, but obviously, when you start talking about, um, you know, door inserts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, not necessarily a fully recyclable product in terms of it could take 10 years before it comes back into the uh, to the circle so it, would it be fair to say that it's not exactly a um uh, fast turn uh, packaging solution um i think from a packaging point of view it uh, it will go through the the cycle fairly quickly i take your point on the doors because the door will hang in your house for 20 years or or, or, or more but uh, on the uh, the paper packaging side, uh, particularly through the retailers, and well, we know how good our paper recovery is in this industry, don't we? So you know uh, that fits uh, fairly well for um, the paper honeycomb, um, and particularly now that uh, you know there's a big drive in the packaging sector on the inbox um, solutions now. Again, replacing EPS, you know, with the die cutting facilities we we're now developing in in, in the industry. You know, we can cut and stamp very thick pieces of paper honeycomb to replace polystyrene. So that inbox bit's getting quite a lot of focus at the moment, uh, as is the home delivery of foods and, um, you know, requirements for thermal control of the product inside. You know, paper honeycomb's good for that. More Neil, exciting side. Was, but, sorry, Neil, Neil um, you, you wanted to interject something there. I was just uh, to picking up on what Tony's saying. I mean, the packaging sector is the biggest part of the, the honeycomb market and is growing like topsy. So as, as Tony says, the, 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 the recycling that, that we're used to in, in the corrugated industry and the uh, folding carton industry is, is 
huge, absolutely it's um, uh, centerpiece there. And it was it was just to add to that that piece that Tony was saying, the new applications for for honeycomb, honeycomb being used as an an insulating material. Um, so there's there's some well known companies, you know, fresh food um, supplier companies and. Um, you know, um, uh, going with great gusto, these organizations, um, that they, they, it's a new a way of receiving our food at home, which has developed because of COVID. Um, so the delivery of food at home and uh, an item that keeps those uh, products that are, are chilled products, it keeps them chilled, is a great innovation. And that's what this does. And of course, the other side is the, the medical side. Um, the, the farmer opportunities of being able to distribute vaccines that need to be chilled. Honeycomb is absolutely the centerpiece of that. So, you know, some, some really clever innovations. And, and, you know, don't get me started on the car industry, of course. And Tony, you know. well, I, I was just going to bring that up myself, the, the car industry, because to go back to Dan's point about being in the, uh, the cycle a long time, the automotive applications are going to be there for a long time. It's, it's graduated from being uh, parcel shelves and boot lids to actually being incorporated in the structure of the car now as they're trying to lightweight uh, for, for batteries and that sort of thing. So it'll stay in the uh, cycle a lot longer. But the benefits it's bringing by the lightweighting is the reduction in energy and you know all the sustainabilities from that side. So there's, there's lots of different ways of looking at the circular economy and you've got to look at it all to uh, really... Uh, get the best solution. And Neil, um, I'm going to uh, just wrap up um, with you, if I may, just um, uh, more of a, um, a sort of an overview comment, uh, comment on, uh, obviously, a lot of the paper mills uh, lead times are at, you know, record highs. Uh, I interviewed a couple of CEOs of, of leading uh, independent packaging producers uh, in Europe over the last few weeks, and they're all saying the same thing. I mean, it, you know, packaging lead times are being pushed now to October. Um, you know, we've never seen anything like it. So um, is the honeycomb sector being affected by the same pressures that, that, that the traditional corrugated and carton mill, uh, mills are, are under at the moment? Yeah, I mean, you know, to, to, in, in our interviews with... Um, uh, members and non-members. This was a, a very common theme that the two things, one is uh, uh, extended lead times and, and a pressure on price upwards. Um, but if they could get the product, the enthusiasm for the for the end product was huge, much as it has been in the corrugated industry you know, for a long time, but much as it's been with this heightened demand for corrugated and heightened demand for cartons over the last six to nine months. I mean, I think the, the, the message for the, the, the paper mills is, is you know, it, this, this looks like it's here to stay, much like it is with corrugated and cartons and, and the growth rate of honeycomb is, um, you know, be, 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 be investing in it because it's, um, it's gonna, there's only one way it's going, that's upwards. And, and actually it's a, it's a very attractive industry. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much indeed for a fascinating insight into uh, an alternative paper uh, packaging product. Um, at the end of this uh, podcast will be the, uh, the web address for EMFA. Uh, so for those who are interested, please do reach out to, uh, to Tony. And uh, gentlemen, thank you so much indeed. Lovely to catch up with you both.